Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what is algebraic geometry. Today we'd like to talk about the why of ringed spaces. In case it wasn't quite clear, I'm not going to talk about ringed spaces themselves a lot. For me, they are like the motivation of, well, introducing morphisms or equivalents to the notion of varieties. And I will see, we'll see in a second... Um, or like in the second video, the, in this video, what this actually means. But it really boils down to, again, a really nice bridge between geometry and algebra. Because remember, remember, if there's one takeaway message of algebraic geometry, it is that geometry and algebra go hand in hand. And sometimes things are easy in geometry, sometimes things are easy in algebra, and you always want to have some correspondence between them. And the notion of ringed space, for me at least, is always just kind of making this bridge. The notion itself may not be as important as the bridge that it does, that it does create. Okay, keep that in mind. So we are not going to talk about ring spaces a lot, um, but just as a reminder, a ring space was just a space, well, let's say it, the variety together with the sheaf of its functions on it. Like a ring space, ring in a sense you associate a ring to things, to open sets in this case. And the really upshot of this definition was that it allowed us to define maps of varieties. And that's what I will going to explore in this video because that's what it's all about. So up to this point, we had varieties, but not really any relations between them. That's like studying topological spaces without studying continuous maps. And it's a bit empty, right? But we can already get started with it, it's not too bad, but it's somehow a bit empty, it doesn't tell you about isomorphisms, equivalences, relations between spaces. But now we had, or in the last video, we actually had this definition of maps of varieties, morphisms of varieties, whatever we want to call them, homomorphisms of varieties, whatever, really whatever you want to call them. And they are the main players, somewhat um, from now on, they play a crucial role, and I want to reiterate what's actually going on by coming back to conic sections, because conic sections, everyone likes conic sections. I hope you like conic sections. If you don't like conic sections, then algebraic geometry might not be right for you, or at least uh, the more explicit version of algebraic variety might not be completely right for you. Um, yeah, conic sections, remember we had hyperbolas, circles, ellipse, whatever you want to call them, and parabolas. So let's me start with a hyperbola, and hyperbola is really just this equation, x, y minus 1 equals 0, which I just to make the picture look nicer, just scaled it, and I decided the scalar 1 minus 1 over 4 is a little bit better than 1, the picture looks a little bit nicer. Forget it. So this is a hyperbola in uh, the usual sense. It has these two branches and whatever. Keep in mind, and this is kind of a crucial that this is a real picture of a hyperbola while secretly i'm always like working over the complex numbers when hyperbola is a kind of takes a different life and we'll see we'll see that actually in this video so now that we have morphisms at hand we can tell you a little bit of a strange thing that happens over the complex numbers but not over the real numbers just keep that in mind anyway so now we have this uh way to answer questions like how many maps are there from a line into an hyperbola so remember that c is really just because it's my ground field it's really just a line in this case so how many maps are there from a line into an hyperbola um not so clear because you would need to write it down and then there's some conditions on continuous and some risky and blah 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 but what you can do is you can and that's kind of the point of this video the point of this whole ring space approach is you can now look at the the maps, uh, a map induces, well, that's complicated. You can now look at the coordinate rings. So the coordinate ring of our, our variety is really just this piece here. You take the defining equation and you mod it out from the polynomial ring. So you have an algebraic object. Remember that was called, as I said, the coordinate ring. And every map between varieties, like in this case, every map from the line to our variety gives rise to a coordinate ring map in the opposite direction. So this uh, the dual, the pullback the, of the map uh, usually reverses the direction. That's just what's, what's happening. Uh, we'll see in a second again why this kind of happens all the time. But anyway, so the direction is reversed. So we are just looking for an algebra map from our space here, uh, this one here, to the polynomial ring because the polynomial ring is a coordinate ring uh, of the line. 
and there are not many maps. I mean, there's essentially only borrowing maps because, well, look at this quotient here. You need to send X to something. You need to send X somewhere. And, but, but you can only send it to something that is invertible by the relation here, right? So X is an invertible element in our ring. So we need to send it to an invertible element, but there are not many invertible elements in the polynomial ring because the polynomial ring is kind of graded by its variable. So the only invertible elements are the scalars. So you don't have any interesting maps. So you don't have any interesting way of putting a line into an hyperbola. And it's kind of easily checked on the, um, on the coordinate rings. And of course you can check that on the geometry side as well, but it's a little bit more, it's a little bit nastier to check on the geometry side. Okay, so hope that makes sense. So that's why we had this notion of morphisms now, because the morphisms turn around on the coordinate ring. So we can have a look at the parabola Here's the equation for the parabola, y equals x squared, right? That's the parabola. Um, and there's a picture of a parabola, again, the real picture of a parabola. And the coordinate ring is whatever it is, just this quotient here. And we're asking the same type of questions. And we again get the map the other way around. But this time we can actually do something. Because now we can just send uh, x to t and y to t squared, and this relation is satisfied. So that's perfect. So you have this map. And this is really just drawing the graph of the parabola. So now, yeah, in, in, in this world, there is a map from the line to the parabola. It's essentially just drawing the graph. But there is no map from the uh, line to the hyperbola. So the hyperbola and the parabola cannot be the same varieties. It's just a very nice way of saying that they're not the same varieties. And at the same time, I think it's a kind of a nice way to see how this correspondence between uh, maps and maps on the coordinate rings uh, actually really works. So here's really just a nice example how this looks like. So the map that sends t to t t squared, which is really the map between the varieties, corresponds to kind of this map here, sending x to t and y to t squared. And why can't you do anything here? Well, you wouldn't need to send t to something like uh, t t inverse to make this work, but just look at this equation. What what do you do for t equals zero? Not so clear. And you can what can you do? And <laughs> so unless t is zero, you can just use this. But what happens for t equals zero? It doesn't really make sense. And you can kind of see that there is no nice map the other way around. So this really can't work. And here it just it just does work uh, really nicely. And it gives rise to this Galois correspondence or the Hilbert Nullstellen. That's again for kind of now maps and classes of varieties, because maps between affine varieties correspond to homomorphisms between the coordinate rings. That's uh, just exactly what I did. And this is just much easier somewhat to check homomorphisms of rings. You can study them completely algebraically. Uh, any computer algebra system will be very happy if you ask it questions about maps between polynomial rings, but it doesn't really want to answer questions about maps between varieties but we know that they are the same by this correspondence, which was induced by the ranked spaces. And this is really why you do that, because you have this nice correspondence between maps and algebraic objects, homomorphisms. And then for the classes itself, you have again a really nice correspondence um, between F and varieties up to isomorphism. In Hilbert's Nullstellen, that's we had something similar, but it was varieties. And now we have varieties up to isomorphism, and they correspond to certain quotients of polynomials, if you want. So um, finally generated reduced K algebras up to isomorphism. It's an algebraic class. You can check everything and kind of explicitly. And this is kind of really nice. And it's kind of really motivated by looking at the hyperbola where you can really see you have no maps and the corresponding rings have no maps and the parabola where you have maps and the corresponding rings have maps. And if you generalize it from the conic sections to um, kind of the general case where you only get, only need an algebraically closed field, works over any algebraically closed field, you get this nice correspondence, this Hilbert's Nullstellen that's that thing uh, now for varieties and their maps between them. And this is really what we're looking for. This is what algebraic geometers do. Uh, geometry, algebra, geometry, algebra, geometry, algebra, and you always want to go between the two sides. Okay, this is essentially what I wanted to do, but when I was preparing this video, I realized that in our coding sections, 
I haven't talked about the ellipse at all, right? So we had um, the parabola, we had the hyperbola, and the circle slash ellipse, where is, actually is it? So here, um, the ellipse in form of a circle, of course, x squared plus y squared equals 1. And if you just do it before looking at the geometric solution, if you want, you can just look at the rings and see that they are isomorphic, so the variety should actually be the same. So the complex ellipse and the complex hyperbola are the same type of objects. Um, do we believe actually that this is right? I'm not sure, but if you just think of the hyperbola as somehow going all the way around, if you want, something like this, then it's somehow like an ellipse that goes all the way around, if you want. Um, but it's kind of a slightly wrong picture because it's really now an instance of the complex numbers that you can see very nicely on the rings. That's kind of the correspondence between geometry and algebra. And if you just do it by hand, then the only thing you need to know is that you can, you can factor this equation here by using the, the square root of minus 1, the imaginary unit i. And then you can just rewrite this equation by calling this guy x, capital X, calling this guy capital Y, and you get the equation of the hyperbola. So in complex lens, so this, I say it again, these pictures that I'm drawing, real pictures, are uh, like here, yeah, my background is clearly R2, um, real pictures are a little bit deceiving in complex land, because in complex land, actually the uh, hyperbola and the ellipse are the same. The parabola is not. I, I showed you that there is a map for the parabola and there is no map from the line to the parabola, but there is no map from the line to the hyperbola. So the parabola is its own class over the complex numbers. And yeah, of the real numbers, they are all different, actually. You can kind of see that here. And you could check that on the rings as well, if you want. If you do that the same for the real rings, then they're not isomorphic, because every isomorphism uses some uh, root of unity, not root of unity, what did I say? Root of minus one, the imaginary unit. Anyway, so that's the why of ringed spaces, because now we can really study maps and get correspondences on the other side for homomorphisms of spaces, for isomorphisms of spaces, and all that fun stuff. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I will talk to you next time.